What happened to Avram and Sarah's converts? Parsha Lech Lecha. Well, let's not jump ahead of ourselves. We know that the Pasuk says at the beginning of Parsha Lech Lecha uh, that Avram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all of their possessions and the et hanefesh asher asu v'charan and the souls that they made in Haran, and they went towards the land of Canaan. So that's the beginning of the story, that's the beginning of the journey. Already before they had reached the land of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Canaan, Avram and Sarai had made souls. Now what does it mean to make a soul? Rashi tells us, based on the Midrash, Rashi says, Asher asu becharan, shehichnisan tachat kanfei hashechina, that he brought them under the wings of the divine presence. Avraham megayeret ha'anashim, v'sara megayeret hanashim. They brought people under the wings of the divine presence, meaning that Avraham converted men, Sarah converted women, uma'ale alehem hakatuv ki ilu asa'um. And scripture attributes to them as if they had actually made these people, really had become, had, were their actual parents, had, had made them from, from nothing, just like having, giving birth to a child. And this, of course, is the greatest consolation to Avram and Sarah, who are childless at this point, that even if you do, are not blessed with a child of your own, but if you can actually take someone who, is, who is, uh, doesn't have something in their life, and you can enrich that person's life, it's as if you gave birth to them. If you give them a spiritual essence that they couldn't have possibly received without you, then you've given birth to them, and that's, those are your children. Um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is a perfect example of someone who was like that. He had millions of children. Right? Rev Simcha Wasserman and his Rebbe had, million, had thousands, if not millions, of children. Uh, and then he writes, Upshuto shel mikra, but he says, but the simple explanation of the verse has nothing to do with making converts. The simple explanation is that they had slaves, they had servants, because asher asu means asher kanu, that they had acquired in Haran. Because the word asa can sometimes contextually also mean to acquire to accumulate. So therefore, it, it just could mean they took, Avram took his wife, his nephew, all of his assets, and the people that he had acquired in Haran as slaves. That's the simple understanding. But the Midrashic explanation is, of course, the converts. Now, the question is, what happened to them? Where are their descendants? The answer to that question is, yes, Ah, okay. Why don't we do that? Why aren't we focusing on converting people? We should be proselytizing. We should be evangelicals, right? We should get out the word, stand on the street corner, and, uh, and try to get people to, to become Jewish. Th that used to be actually an endeavor that many Jews were involved in. It stopped in the period of the Romans, if not before. Um, because there was a realization among the sages that we were diluting the quality of our people because people would become, would attach themselves to the faith, and then they would quickly slip off. And this may be something that is alluded to in the story of Avram and Sarah, because there are many people who say that since we have no remnant of Avram and Sarah's converts, that's a sign that they didn't last. Avram and Sarah were charismatic leaders, and when they died, their, uh, their following died with them. So that's, that's altogether possible. Which, of course, is a very sobering thought. It's, it's also a little disappointing when you think about it. If Avram was the father of, of our faith, we would have expected him to accomplish much more. Is it just because of his charismatic personality that he was able to attract people? What about the message? If the message is eternal and the message is ultimate truth, 
then why didn't it stick with these people? So the conventional answer, um, which really I believe, well, where, where are their descendants? No one, no one claims to be an Abrahamic Gentile. There are no Jews who are descended from anyone other than Yitzchak and Yaakov. So where, where are all the Jews that Avram and Sarah made? So where are they? The, the conventional answer to this question is very, is very simple. When it says that they were converting people, we have a different notion of what conversion is from what the Medrash is referring to in the pre-Torah age, the pre-Sinai event, you know. And what converting means is taking someone who is a pagan and is idolatrous and is a heathen and who has multiple wives, some of them animals and some of them little boys, and getting them to live an ethical life of kindness, of goodness, of morality. What you and I would perhaps call the Shiva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the seven Noachide laws, okay? That's what Avram and Sarah were engaged in. They were engaged in teaching, for lack of a better term, ethical monotheism. Be a good person, believe in God. There's, there is only one God. And that was a resounding success to the point where we can trace back many different sects of people who had at least a notion of monotheism and ethics, a Hammurabi's code, if you will, other kinds of moral codes that existed even in the ancient world, which according to our tradition can be traced back to Avraham and Sarah. They were the progenitors of all of the ideas that come from Western, that are, are a product uh, for what we call Western society, okay? So that would be the simple answer, yes? But of course, the fact that it's not so easily traceable leads to a whole um, uh, uh, body of literature that talks about this idea about what happened to Avram and Sarah's converts. There's an interesting idea that's mentioned in a couple of contexts about Avraham's struggle and the tests that he had to undergo through life. And part of those tests had to do with his life project, which was to influence other people in his life to get them to do the right thing and to be good and to follow in his ways. And there were many uh, junctures in his life where he felt a conflict between being faithful to what Hashem told him to do and that project. One of those examples is the mitzvah of Brit Milah, which we get at the end of the Parsha. So there are many Mephorshim who say that the reason why circumcising himself was such a test, it wasn't the surgery per se. If God tells you, cut off a piece of your skin, okay, it'll hurt, but what's the big deal? You'll recuperate, right? What the real test was is how is this going to play in Peoria, as the, as the saying goes. How is this going to play to all of the people that have become my converts? The good, I, Hebra, I got good news and bad news. The good news is, it's Rosh Hashanah tonight, we get to dip the apple in the honey. The bad news is, we're all going to get circumcised. What circumcision? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm done. Let me out of here. Okay, so, so that's, that's the idea behind Avraham's concern. As a matter of fact, we have a medrash at the very beginning of next week's Parsha where God appears to Avraham after his brit milah, after his bris. It says, Vayeroi lov Hashem be'elonei mamre, that God appeared to Avraham in the plains of Mamre. Now, do we, does it really matter where God appeared to Avraham. Why does the Torah say that he was in the plains of Mamre? Mamre was a friend of Avraham, after all. And Avraham was living at a pitched tent in some flat land that belonged to his friend Mamre. Who cares? So the, uh, the, the Medrash quoted by Rashi says, Be'ilonei Mamre, hu shenatan lo eitza ala milah, source number four. Uh, Mamre gave him advice about the bris. And therefore, uh, God appeared to Avraham after his bris 
in the plains of Mamre, sort of as a reward that Mamre gave him good advice. So the, all the commentaries are very bothered by this Rashi. What does it mean, Mamre gave Avraham advice about his bris? What is that supposed to mean? God said, circumcise thyself. What, do you need to ask anyone advice about a direct command from Hashem? <coughs> what advice was Mamre giving to Avraham? So there are a number of answers to this question. The Dad Zikanim, uh, uh, also a medieval commentary, says, he first quotes Rashi. He says, V'tema, is like, I don't understand this. V'chi adam chashu v'tzadika Avraham v'nit naseh be'eser nisyonot v'amad b'kulan v'lo sha'al eitza. He says, Avraham had a, 10 tests in his life, and he unhesitatingly uh, fulfilled God's command each and every time. Never had to ask anyone advice about whether or not he should do it. He says, Eich sha'al eitza al hamila she'tzivao ha'kadosh baruchu. Why did he need to ask advice about whether to circumcise himself or not? I mean, it's ridiculous when you think about it. What was, why did he have to consult with Mamre? So he answers, V'yesh lomar she'chas v'shalom she'yishal eitza im yimolim lav. Right? He says, God forbid that was never Avram's doubt. Of course he knew he had to circumcise himself. That wasn't what he was consulting with Mamre about. Ela im ya'ase betzina o befarhesya. But the question that he had for Mamre was, do you think I should do this on the QT? Like, should I do this quietly that no one should know about it? Or should I make a big party and let everyone know, you're all invited to the bris of Avram Avinu? Yeah? Um, and Mamre said, no, be proud of what you're doing. God told you to have a bris? Sounds great. I think you'll attract a lot of people. And Avram was a little bit incredulous from Mamre because his, his gut told him just the opposite. That this, and this was his whole hesitation. He said, I'm worried that the people that I'm bringing closer to Hashem are just going to run away once I tell them that they really have to make this tremendous sacrifice. And Mamre's attitude was no. He says, listen, the whole idea of a bris is that there has to be bilateral commitment. You've shown people the beauty of Judaism, the beauty of the service of Hashem, but that you haven't made them commit to anything. You haven't required of any quid pro quo. So this is their opportunity. You're giving them a tremendous opportunity to sort of give up something of themselves so that they feel that they're invested in this, in this, uh, in this group that you've started. And that's why you should do it publicly and just to the contrary, you think people are going to run away, people are going to come. He says, on that very day, Avram had his bris, is what the Torah says at the end of our parsha, which means not only on that self-same day that God commanded him that he have his bris, but in broad daylight, at the, at the height of the day, is what means. When everyone could see, Avram said, I got nothing to hide, well, maybe he did, but in this context. But I'm saying, but, but the event itself, he wanted to publicize, he wanted to let everyone know that this is a beautiful thing that's happening with balloons and with uh, the glitter and the, the catering and all of that other stuff. This is what it's all about. Yes? I'm confused. I thought you just said five minutes ago that they didn't necessarily become Jews, that they took on the Yes. Mean they don't need a bris, right? Well, they don't need a bris in the sense that if they're not converting officially to Judaism, they don't need a bris. But if you're part of Avram's household, you still need to commit to Hashem in this particular way for this particular generation. Avram, Hashem told him, if you look at the end of the parsha, everyone in Avram's household, his slaves as well, had a brit, had a brit milah. What the nature of that Brit Milah, we have to remember not to think too halachically when we talk about events that happened before Matan Torah. For example, there's a medrash that says that Yosef, when he was in Mitzrayim, would only feed the Egyptian men after they circumcised themselves. That wasn't a halachic Brit Milah. It was really to, to elevate their spiritual nature. And here, too, it's not necessarily that there was a halachic directive that uh, every non-Jew who wants to be an ethical monotheist has to have a bris.
But Avraham was trying to, in this very, very early stage of what we would call ethical monotheism, he was trying to amass a following. And part of that amassment of a following was show some level of commitment to Hashem. And it turns out that other people felt that this was a good idea too. Doesn't mean that a Gentile should feel this duty to, to have a brit milah. There is no mitzvah for a non-Jew to have a bris. But in this context, in that age, that would be the explanation of why, why they had it. Also, we know that how, even from a halachic standpoint, a Jew who owns an Eved Kena'ani, a Gentile slave, that Gentile slave becomes obligated in certain mitzvot, and they have to go through a conversion of sorts. Um, but this is getting a little bit too technical. But part of that conversion is brit milah. But anyway. Um, there is, of course, the Hasidic approach. You can take a look in uh, source number six this, from this photocopy. Rashi, he quotes Rashi, and then he says, What happened to those converts? We have no remnant of them in the annals of history. Oh, so let, let, me, let me just, before I get to the answer, so let me just point out that one, there's one uh, stream of commentaries who suggest that it's true that Avram amassed a great following, but whether it was because of the bris or whether it was because of Akedas Yitzchak, where they heard that Avram was about to slaughter his son, or there could have been other things that happened to Avram, the anti-Semitism that he experienced in his life, it could be that those events in Avram's personal life were things that distanced people. And so there are some commentaries who say that it's that the message was beautiful, but people were not willing to pay the price of being part of Avram's people because they saw the very, very deep price that one had to pay. Okay, so that's, that's one approach. The second approach is like this Hasidic approach is that Barama Achare Peti Ratoshel Avraham Avinu the other approach is, you know, quite simply, Avram was this charismatic leader, and after he died, they didn't want to follow the next Rebbe. You know, you know Rebbes are dynastical. You know, if you're the, the Gera Rebbe, it's the son follows the father, the bells, it's the same thing, right? So, you know, you got to get lucky. You know, who's to say that the, the, the older man who was the Rebbe before he was, he was amazing. But maybe his son, like, I don't get along with the son, but I'm still a, a Gera Chassid, I'm a Belzer Chassid, or whatever it is. Who's to say that I'm going to feel that bond or connection to the next Rebbe in the, in the dynasty? So this, is, of course, takes a very Hasidish perspective of the, the, the history of the Avot. He says, Mishum she'etzel Avraham avinu ra'u rak midat He said, because it was only with... Um, it was only as it pertains to Avram that people saw that Avram's hallmark was kindness, charity, taking care of people, gemilut chasadim, hachnasat orchim, all of these wonderful mitzvot. Velo yachlu lihistagel midat hapachad v'hagvura shel Yitzchak. But Yitzchak was quite a different kind of person. His whole approach in his service of Hashem was based on austerity, justice, we have to do the right thing, and uh, gevura, right, which is, um, you know, very serious. There's, of course, you know, the, the, the two different approaches, the very serious approach and the very loving approach. Is it fear of God or is it love of God? And Avram emphasized more the love, and Yitzchak was pachat, was the fear, the trepidation, the sense of the Almighty God is upon you, repent sinners, you know, that, that kind of, of attitude. And therefore they left. They, 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 Yitzchak did not have that same charismatic personality that attracted people, and that's the reason why they left after Avram passed away. Now, of course, I think Yitzchak gets a really bad rap in this interpretation. I think that that's not giving enough credit to Yitzchak Avinu, because even though, yes, he was a different personality from his father, but 
it doesn't seem reasonable that if he had any sense of seichel that he would have played those cards the same way to people that his father had brought close to, to, to Yiddishkeit. So if you take a look in Rabbeinu Bechaya, he says something quite interesting. He says, we're not going to have time to go into it inside, but let me just point out that there's a passage later on that talks about the life of Yitzchak Avinu in Parshat Toldot. And it says, V'chol ha-be'erot asher chafru avdei aviv bimei Avraham aviv, sitemum plishtim v'yemalum afar. All of the wells that were dug by Avraham and his servants in his father's lifetime were filled up by the Philistines. The Philistines took earth and they filled up those wells and they filled up those wells with dirt. Now, of course, that's relating a historical event and it's showing the strife that existed between Yitzchak and the Philistines. But Rabbeinu Bachaya says something that there's a much deeper meaning to this story about the Philistines filling up the wells. That really what this is a reference to, the digging of wells, is the cultivation of people that existed in the life of Avraham. Avraham Avinu succeeded in digging and plumbing the depths of the people of his generation. He lived in a time when people were hungry for spiritual growth, when people recognized that there was something missing in their lives. And so Avram succeeded in digging wells, and in those wells he found the water in the depths of people's souls. And what happened was, is that the Philistines came along, this new group of people. By the way, if you look, if you, if you study, if you ever want to study the history of the Philistines, the Philistines were not an indigenous people to the land of Canaan. They came from, um, they came from the area around Turkey and Greece, and they migrated to the Middle East. And as a result, and they took over the, uh, the part of Azza, you know, which is, which is Philistine territory, even perhaps to this day. But the fact is, they were not an indigenous people. But what they brought to the land of Canaan was a new ethos, a new attitude, and what it means when it says that they poured dirt into the wells that Avram had dug, what it means is that they changed the landscape of man's aspiration for spirituality. They sort of deflated that whole uh, human endeavor for spiritual growth and from coming close to Hashem. Whatever it was, Maybe they had Facebook. I don't know. But the Philistines had something that sort of um, distracted people away from the desire to serve Hashem and to become close to Hashem. And that's what it means when it says that they filled up Avraham's wells with dirt. And it was Yitzchak's challenge that even in a generation like that, that he would have to find a way to, re to dig up the wells and, and even dig new wells. And that was his challenge to discover new ways in order to inspire people in a new generation. And I have to tell you, the reason why this speaks to me so much is because I'm old enough to remember the world as it was 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, the world, and you probably, some of you may remember even longer ago than I, than I do. But the point is, is that you look at the Kirov movement and how it's evolved over the last 30, 40 years. And we can notice that the world is a different world today from what it was when people were excited about becoming a Baal Tshuva. We don't have that same excitement anymore. Um, uh, for whatever reason, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and whoever else is out there and the atheists of the world have taken those wells that were dug 30 years ago and they filled them with dirt. And it's not sufficient for us to try and redig those wells because as the story with Yitzchak tells us, the Philistines will just fill them up with dirt again. Sometimes you have to know how to dig new wells and figure out how to, how to mine new sources of water that the Philistines will not immediately fill up with dirt. And so instead of incriminating or pointing the finger at Yitzchak, oh, he didn't have the same charisma, he didn't have the same attitude towards serving Hashem as his father Avram. What Rabbeinu Bechaya essentially tells us is, is that it's not his fault. The zeitgeist of his generation was totally different from that of his father. And that's the reason why he couldn't succeed to the same degree that his father did. And it was the Philistines and their ilk who drew all of Avraham's and Sarah's converts away from 
the root away from the source. But what I want to leave you with is this, uh, just two last points, and that is number one, perhaps the very reason why Avraham was not successful in retaining the converts for perpetuity was because of the fact that he didn't demand as much of them as we do from our real converts, the, convert, the, the real Geirei Tzedek of today. Avraham in his desire really to bring everyone in, this basically created this atmosphere where I accept you as you are unconditionally. You're an idolater, no problem, just wash your feet, come into my tent, I accept you. Learn a little bit about what it means to love your fellow man and to love God, and that's all you need to know, and you're part of the, you're part of the family. You want a bris? Fantastic, have a bris. And that kind of attitude where there's less commitment that is required is wonderful to be able to welcome in the stranger and to bring more people into the presence of Hashem. But if you want it to last, it has to be a, there has to be that quid pro quo. There has to be that level of commitment that the adherent himself or herself feels that this is my commitment to make this a lasting effort that I can pass on to myself, to my children, to my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, so that they will know that they are different from the rest of the world. And that perhaps is the reason why, if you're going to argue that it didn't stick, that may be the reason why it didn't stick. And the last point I'll mention from the Meshachachma is that at the end of the day, the thing that, made Avra, that gave Avram the most consolation in life was the fact that he had a son, Yitzchak. Because after all of the effort that we put into bringing other people under the presence of the divine wings, when it's our own child, we know that we can impart to them uh, certain things that we may not necessarily be able to impart to people who aren't our own children. And that's why it says that with Avraham it says, Vayita Eshel Be'er Shava, he planted a tree in Be'er Sheva, and that's in next week's Parsha, Vayikra Sham B'Shem Hashem Kel Olam, and he called out in the name of God, forever, the God of forever. When what the Meshachach means, says what it means is that he says, you're the God, you're the eternal God. There's an, e an eternality to your, uh, to your belief system now that I have a Yitzchak to carry it on. Up until now, I knew it was somewhat ephemeral and it was somewhat fleeting because the people that are, are coming into my tent, they'll come, they'll go, it'll stick, it won't stick. But now that I have a son Yitzchak, that I can really impart and focus all of my energies on, I know that this is an, there's an eternality, there's a, a, a permanence to the Torah that you have given to me and, that I, the, and the message that I want to be able to impart to, my, to future generations. And that we also have to remember. We have to remember that um, we have to invest as much as we can into the people that are our children, our grandchildren, or the ones that we deem to be our children or grandchildren. Because sometimes you, you, never, you never know what's going to happen to the people who, that you work with and try to bring into your fold. They may or may not last. But at the end of the day, the people that are count the most are, are the children that create that sense of legacy for you in the future. Okay, so those are my ideas.